Flights resume in Hong Kong after days of violence, which saw the airport descend into chaos, with police using batons and tear gas on demonstrators. Iran's president is strongly rejecting any type of foreign security mission in the region as tensions between the Islamic Republic and the United States continue to rise. And a member of the Israeli parliament refuses to leave the podium, saying she was heckled by activists from a far-right party as the Attorney General is calling for two extreme right candidates to be disqualified from running in the next election. Hello, I'm Sarah Coates. Thanks for joining me. We begin in Hong Kong, where China is slamming protesters for what they call terrorist-like acts, following mass protests at the airport, which grounded flights for a number of days. Demonstrators clashing with police inside the terminal as they staged a sit-in over a controversial extradition bill, which then morphed into a number of other issues, with demonstrators demanding Hong Kong's leader Carrie Lam step down. Erica Jackson brings us the details. Hong Kong Airport, one of the busiest in the world, finally reopening, with flights taking off after a night of violent clashes. This after the airport obtained a temporary injunction to ban protesters from entering some areas. It all comes after hundreds of flights canceled due to protests of pro-democratic activists causing chaos that paralyzed the transportation hub. I just want to go home now. It's a bit frightening to see so many protesters surrounding here. The protest happened when I arrived here and again now when I'm leaving. The demonstrations taking place for 10 weeks and protesters fighting with police using batons and firing pepper spray and demonstrators holding down a man they believe to be an undercover police officer. Police in Hong Kong calling for calm. We always use force with restraint. We never wish to see any injury or casualties. If you still believe in peaceful, rational and nonviolent expression of speech, I appeal to you to cut ties with all rioters. Meanwhile, satellite images show China's military in Shenzhen, a city near the border with Hong Kong. U.S. intelligence also confirming the information about the deploying of armored vehicles to the border. The demonstrations began with many opposing the proposed extradition bill that would have let residents be extradited to stand trial in mainland China, but have evolved even more with a demand for an independent inquiry into police behavior and the pro-democracy movement. Moving now to the death of multi-billionaire and convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein and two prison guards have been suspended and a jail warden temporarily stepped down as the investigation into his demise continues. New reports are also coming in saying that corrections officers may have falsified reports saying that they checked on Epstein as required by protocol. Now, this is a Justice Department is taking action against the warden and two staffers who were supposed to be watching Epstein, although one of them wasn't even a corrections officer. More in the next report. Tonight, the first fallout from the Jeffrey Epstein suicide. Attorney General William Barr ordering the warden to be pulled from the jail and temporarily reassigned. Two staff members on Epstein's unit placed on administrative leave pending the outcome of the investigations. This comes after sources tell ABC News one of the workers was not a designated corrections officer. A law enforcement official says Epstein used a bed sheet to hang himself. The FBI and NYPD scouring Epstein's private island. Sources tell us they're looking to find evidence of co-conspirators in Epstein's inner circle, including close associate Ghislaine Maxwell. In a now settled 2015 defamation suit against Maxwell, Virginia Roberts Gouffre says that Maxwell recruited her to be a teenage sex slave to Epstein. The training started immediately. How to be quiet, be subservient, give Jeffrey what he wants. A lot of this training came from Ghislaine herself. Maxwell denies the allegations. Her whereabouts are unknown. 
It's interesting to know that there's a lot of activity on the island with people coming and going. There's been ample opportunity for anyone to remove any kind of damning or, or incriminating material uh, prior to authorities' arrival on Monday. It's been five weeks already since he was first arrested and 14 years since any allegations were first made against Epstein. And for more on this story, let's bring in our senior international affairs correspondent, Owen Altman. Owen, tell me... Just how transparent can we really expect this investigation to be? Well, listen, Sarah, obviously a lot of people in the United States and a lot of us watching from outside the United States are going to be asking exactly that question. Obviously, all eyes are going to be focused on this inquiry. The attorney general has come out and said that he wants to get to the bottom of this and he'll let the facts be known. But again, obviously, there are going to be a lot of questions about this. Look, uh, I suspect that there will be a fair amount of transparency just because there's going to be so much demand for it. But will that put the conspiracy theories to rest? I doubt it. Mm, certainly. And uh, Donald Trump, the president, he uh, was someone that knew Jeffrey Epstein. Tell me, what are we hearing from him? Well, Donald Trump has been vocal about this, as about so many other issues. Let's hear what he had to say about this issue just in the last day or so. Do you really think that Clintons are involved with Jeffrey Epstein's death? I have no idea. I know he was on his plane 27 times, and he said he was on the plane four times. But when they checked the plane log, Bill Clinton, who was a very good friend of Epstein, he was on the plane about 27 or 28 times. So why did he say four times? And then the question you have to ask is, did Bill Clinton go to the island? Because Epstein had an island that was not a good place, as I understand it, and I was never there. So you have to ask, did Bill Clinton go to the island? That's the question. If you find that out, you're going to know a lot. Well, Sarah, I don't know that Donald Trump is necessarily explicitly saying that somehow Bill Clinton was behind this, but maybe that suggested a little bit in what he had to say. But of course, Bill Clinton's connections with Jeffrey Epstein, you have to say, is fair game for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Absolutely can use that. Bill Clinton had a very close relationship with Jeffrey Epstein by all accounts. And whether or not the precision of what the president's facts were is right, Look, the reality is, again, taking aim at Bill Clinton for that seems to be fair game for Donald Trump. Of course, Donald Trump had his own relationship with Jeffrey Epstein and the Democrats, and Donald Trump's political opponents can litigate that. But no shortage of powerful politicians who had some kind of relationship and some kind of connection with Jeffrey Epstein. And oh, when you mentioned just before that there are just so many conspiracy theories uh, floating around regarding this apparent suicide, tell me... Just how far will this investigation go to quelling some of those? Well, Sarah, let's look at what we know so far, what's come out in the reporting about this from The New York Times, for example, that there were two guards who just were asleep that night and falsified the records, meaning they wrote down that they went by and saw Jeffrey Epstein when they actually didn't. They're going to probably face trial for that. Again, that may well be a federal crime. But it doesn't necessarily point to some grand conspiracy to let Jeffrey Epstein commit suicide, let alone have him murdered, as so many people have suggested has happened. There are still obviously a lot of other questions around this. Why was he taken off suicide watch? Again, when he had tried to commit suicide watch just six days before that. And then why was his cellmate taken out? Again, because people apparently in that facility who had been taken off of suicide watch and then moved into this special housing unit had cellmates with them. Why was the cellmate taken out? Who is responsible for that decision? But nothing yet really points to some kind of grand conspiracy. And one of the most striking things about this entire episode is just how willing so many Americans have been to believe the worst and to believe the most severe conspiracy theories about this, not just trolls on Twitter, not just Donald Trump and his insinuations, but major public intellectuals, major media personalities. Everyone seems to be thinking in that direction. And it's hard to put those conspiracy theories to rest. And going back to your first question, will even the most transparent of investigations do so? It's a really big question, and it says so much about this moment in the United States, about just how willing so many people are to believe the worst in a situation like this where obviously there are a lot of very problematic facts, but to actually believe the worst and to be suspicious more mundane theories that there was just overstaffing and maybe some guards were doing things they shouldn't have done. Mm, I know, and certainly this must be a real uh, kick in the teeth for those victims who have come forward who really wanted to, uh, you know, to see Jeffrey Epstein go on trial there. But of course now that will not happen. Uh, Owen, thank you so much for coming in to talk about that.
And we are going out for a short break, but after this, a member of the Israeli parliament refuses to leave the podium after being heckled by two far right wing opponents. More after this, stay with us. I-24 News, the international channel in the heart of the Middle East, now brings you a new view of this troubled region. From I-24 News' acclaimed Arabic language channel, the stories, the people, the passions of the Middle East that you haven't seen before. A weekly roundup of highlights from I-24 News Arabic. Every Sunday, only on I-24 News. Unflinching, outspoken, and to the point, the most complete coverage of the day's events. Weeknights, watch Crossroads for analysis, interviews, and reporting that connects us to the Middle East and the world. Watch Crossroads, 6 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Esta semana, News 24, Bodas de Sangre. La compleja relación entre Benjamin Netanyahu y a Víctor Lieberman. Cambio climático. Israel simula una sequía y estudia el impacto de dicho fenómeno. Pasaron solo 50 años. La camada de alumnos de 1969 del Mahon Greenberg Instituto de Docentes en Jerusalén se reúne y festeja el reencuentro en Israel. News 24, el magazine semanal en español de I-24 News. Whether you're just getting out of bed or starting your day, or you're already hard at work, we cut through the clutter to give you the right dose. Breaking news and top headlines from Israel, the Middle East, and around the world. Politics, pop culture, sports, and music. We track the big stories from the heart of the Middle East. Brace yourself for your daily dose of news. Welcome back. Israel's Attorney General Abahai Mandelblit is calling for two extreme right candidates to be disqualified from running in the next election, although they say there are no grounds to prohibit its leader. Now, the pair from the extremist Otzma Yehudit party have a record of coming up with racist statements about Arabs. Mandelblit basing his recommendations on the basic law of the Israeli parliament, which says candidates cannot run for office if... They engage in incitement to racism. Otsma Yehidid responding, saying they're now trying to overthrow a right-wing government. Meanwhile, another member of parliament, this time from Israel's Democratic Union, has today refused to leave the podium in parliament when asked to step down by the Central Elections Committee judge, Hanan Meltzer. Stav Shafir says she did so because she was heckled by activists from the Otsma Yehidid party with her microphone then shut down and ushers coming in trying to remove her. And for more, let's uh, bring in our diplomatic correspondent, Mike Wagenheim, who is standing by there at the Israeli parliament. Mike, thanks for joining me. Firstly, let's talk about this incident we just reported with Stav Shafir. Tell me, what exactly happened there? 
Shafir a bit upset. She felt her time got cut short as she was presenting her case by, uh, by uh, the reason why uh, certain members of the Jewish Power Party, the far right, uh, some would label extremist party, uh, should be disqualified from running for the upcoming Israeli parliament. This is part of uh, what's going on here today with the Central Elections Committee. Uh, various politicians and organizations are laying their petitions on the table, trying to get this candidate or that candidate disqualified. Everything from the Arab far left to the Jewish far right, and even centrist uh, candidate Yair Lapid of the Blue and White Party, who released a uh, anti-ultra-orthodox video on his Twitter feed uh, about a week and a half ago that caused a bit of a storm. They're trying to get him disqualified as well. The, the guidelines are, if, if you're, if you're um, an inciter of racism or if you deny uh, that Israel is a Jewish state, so there's qualifications on the traditional political right and political left, then you can be disqualified. It rarely, rarely happens, though, in this committee. And even more so, the committee's decision is not even final. It can go up to the Supreme Court and usually does go up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has only disqualified one individual candidate ever. But that happened to be this year in the April election. Prior to that, the leader of the Jewish Power Party, Mikhail Ben-Ari, was disqualified. So there is recent precedent. So what happens here today kind of lays the groundwork for a possible Supreme Court appeal. That's why you're hearing so everybody's being so passionate here today and so emphatic uh, about the reasons why they believe their particular uh, political enemies should be banished uh, from the Israeli parliament. But most of it, 99% of it, just political theater, uh, camera time for these politicians as they try to make their case politically, not for the other side, but more so for themselves. And Mike, so you're saying slim chances are that they may be disqualified, but if in fact they are, tell me, what could the ramifications be for the upcoming election, which of course is being held on September 17 of this year? Well, don't get me wrong. I, I think there is a chance, in fact, that the two members of the Jewish Power Party, Baruch Marzal and ben, uh, Bensi Gopstein, are going to be disqualified. But the Jewish Power Party, uh, in no poll yet, has shown that they can get over the mandatory threshold to qualify for the next Israeli parliament, although they are creeping up a little bit in the polls. So by that standard, it would have zero effect if they don't make it, and they're likely not to make it. Meanwhile, there's no way that the uh, Israeli Supreme Court or this particular committee is going to banish the Arab parties uh, from the uh, Israeli parliament. It's a it's kind of a, a, a source of pride in Israeli democracy that the Arab parties hold uh, the power that they do. And Yair Lapid, a mainstream candidate that some people love and some people love to hate, but the committee is not going to throw him out for one uh, Twitter video that some found objectionable. So in the end, it'll likely just be the Jew, uh, two members of Jewish Power, who Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit uh, filed a legal opinion saying that they should be disqualified. Everybody else is going to slide on through not only this, but also the Supreme Court. Mike Wagenheim there at the Israeli Parliament. Really appreciate the update. We'll come back to you a little later on in the day. Thanks so much. Now, two politicians with the left-wing Democratic Union Electoral Alliance yesterday met with Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. Now, one of the pair is the granddaughter of former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who signed the landmark Oslo Accords that created the PA. Noah Rothman says that she and Abbas agree on an important point that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is trying to torpedo the peace process. Meanwhile, Jordan's foreign ministry is slamming Israel for allowing Jews to enter the Temple Mount during the Muslim holiday of Eid, which saw violent clashes breaking out between worshippers. Now, according to Israel's Khan News, Jordan even sent an official letter to Israel through diplomatic channels expressing its opposition to Security Minister Gilad Adan after he said that it's time for Jews to be allowed to pray there. Jordan also demanding that Israel stop all attempts to change the status quo there. Moving out of the tension between Iran and Washington, which has been heightening, and the Islamic Republic's President Hassan Rouhani has come out to say that Iran and Gulf states can step in and protect the security of the region with foreign forces not needed. Now, this as the United States has launched a mission in the Gulf waters backed by Britain following the seizure of a British-flagged tanker in the region last month. 
Now, the rift between Washington and Tehran has been deepening after the US pulled out of the 2015 nuclear accord last year, with Iran then saying it will not stick to the terms of the deal, leaving the remaining signatories scrambling to find ways to keep the deal alive. More drama for social media giant Facebook with Bloomberg reporting that it paid contractors to listen in on phone conversations. Now, it's understood Facebook has admitted it did so, but says it was with the permission of users, but has now been stopped. Now, it's just the latest in a string of incidents for the social media company, which has just paid a record $5 billion fine for misusing the private data of millions of users, which was then sold off to Cambridge Analytica. Um, for more on this story, let's bring in our tech correspondent, Ariel Levin Waldman. Ariel, tell me, just how concerning is this for the millions of Facebook users all around the world? Well, there's obviously a cause for concern. While there is this statement that you had to opt in for your conversation to be monitored by human listeners, the fact is there was never any statement towards that effect in the terms and conditions. There was never any statement to that effect that went down in public. And also to opt in on this program only required the input of one person in any given conversation. If you have a multi-way conversation between four people, three of which don't opt in, one does, then Facebook would still be able to listen in on this conversation. Conversation. Now, it's more of a concern that people were not addressed of the uh, nature of the call here, and it's given way and comes at a very bad time when there's already conspiracy theories flying around that Facebook is accessing your phone's microphone, that it's accessing your computer's microphone and listening in conversations. Right now, everyone's saying that they didn't search anything on Google, but they were talking about a product with their friends, and the next thing they know, they're getting Facebook advertisements for it. The next thing you know, you're getting Google advertisements of it. Whether or not Facebook actually had an opt-in or an opt-out option on this, it comes at a very bad time for the company's image when right now people are starting to scrutinize whether or not the social media companies have too much power. Mm, and I'm sure a lot of trust uh, has been lost in these social media companies. And when you mentioned just then uh, with uh, the product, you know, popping up in, the, in your feed after you've been, say, chatting with it to your friends, I, I've had this happen to me, is there any way that people can sort of protect uh, themselves from any possible breaches uh, by these companies to, well, to shut off your microphone. The best way you can protect yourself from breaches of private data on a social media platform is to not use a social media platform. One of the issues is every time you sign up for one of these services, you get a whole list of terms and conditions you have to agree to before using the service. It's an end user license agreement. You just check a box, but it's 60 pages or so of contract that's more or less giving away all of your rights to your own data on that platform. As long as you're going to use this platform, you're signing away all your rights to your data, your information, your browsing history, literally everything. On top of that, it's more than just on these platforms. Every single advertiser out there, every single product that has a like button on their page or a follow option on their page is usually operating through Facebook. Even if you yourself don't have a Facebook account or any other social media companies, the simple fact of the matter is every company you do your shopping with usually operates through the network that is held by either Facebook or Google. You know, combined Facebook and Google hold upwards of 90% of the advertising market. There really is no way to get away from these services, especially given that these services do put, as mentioned before, in their licensing agreement, in their terms and condition, that you're signing away all of your private information. Mm, certainly very concerning. Ariel Levin Waldman, thanks so much. Now, in New York, a cult classic Baz Luhrmann film has gone from the screen to the stage in Moulin Rouge. The musical, I-24 News correspondent Ariel Hickson gives us an inside look at the unique production that's turning heads on Broadway. It's a story of freedom, beauty, no truth, yourself. and love. You're In welcome. Moulin Rouge, the musical Girl no Meets matter. Boy against the fiery enigma of a bohemian revolution in 1899. The second you step into Moulin Rouge, you can see it's truly a unique play, taking the classic film and transforming it into a performance never seen before on Broadway. The production is based off the 2001 Academy Award-winning film that stunned moviegoers with its eccentric plot and dazzling design. I'm sure there's so many people who are obsessed with the movie who are coming here to watch it. What can they expect to see from this show? 
A lot of what you love in the movie, an epic love story set in a very lavish setting, uh, you'll see all of that, but it will be different because you'll actually be in the room with the people doing it. That's the magic of live theater. You feel like you could reach out and touch the people and you're a part of the action. Moulin Rouge is a now, viewers will get to experience the captivating story and jukebox musical up close. I want to feel like I'm coming in and there's like, you know, I'm in the club, people are handing me a glass of absinthe and, you know, and music's playing and I'm in for a great time. And that's, that's what we really try to give as you enter the theater. Paired with the enchanting set and avant-garde performances, the audience struggles to differentiate between fiction and reality. I hope the audience can come in and just kind of let go of everything they might be dealing with and let go of the world outside and just really be transported to another place and hopefully from the moment they walk in the theater they feel that way. The timeless love story touches all and its new run seeks to inspire a whole new generation. Ariel Hickson, I-24 News. And finally, a pair of white lion cubs are being shown off in the northwest of France after being born in July of this year. The cute cubs, Simba and Nala, make up just a handful of the lions, which are native to South Africa, with only a few remaining in the wild. Now, their parents were rescued from a circus and are now being cared for at the zoo. And we will leave you with these gorgeous images. But we are continuing to bring you all of the breaking stories, so do go ahead and visit us online. That's i24news.tv, and we have all of those stories on all of our social media platforms. I'm Sarah Coates. Thanks for watching.